eyes. Uh, and it's just such a pleasure to be back with him in uh, as a colleague and partner as we grow our program here in New York. Uh, so he's asked me to talk a little bit about the treatment of hepatitis C in special populations. So what I'd like to do is have a very brief introduction since everyone here really is well aware of what the treatments are, uh, just so we uh, get that sort of out there and then talk about some of the few special populations because those populations are getting uh, fewer you know, and far between. So I always like to start by saying, you know, we've just come a tremendous way. Uh, I can remember sitting in the early 1990s uh, with Gene Schiff and Sheila Sherlock and having discussions about this new entity called hepatitis C and then trying interferon, which didn't work and really making it difficult for patients when we would treat them uh, with those medications with poor efficacy and tremendous side effects. And to, to think that 30 years from, from then on where we are today, that we essentially have these all oral medications without any significant side effects that cure the vast majority uh, of patients that we treat, probably 95 to 99% uh, is really just an amazing feat and which is why some of my friends earlier, or I guess last year, uh, won the Nobel Prize uh, for their work in the development of these therapies uh, for hepatitis C. So what you can see here are the five most common therapies now used around the world. I'm going to avoid you know, any type of naming of them because they do have different names in different parts uh, of the world. So we'll stick to you know, what their generic names are. The key here is that they're all oral for the most part. Uh, they're pan-genotypic. They certainly treat at least several uh, different genotypes. And the treatment courses that we use are short. Uh, varying from eight weeks to 16 weeks, some with or without ribavirin, depending upon uh, the disease state. Uh, but we've come a really long way. And the reality is that anyone who gets these medicines uh, should be cured if they take it uh, because of the ability we have, even a few who fail to have salvage therapy. And, and I think therefore, uh, hold on, I'm just trying to move this forward. There we go. So if we look at this and we look at what the cure rates are, and I think this is just amazing uh, based upon genotype and you know, depending upon where you are across the world, uh, you'll know what is the most common genotype in your region. Uh, but we can essentially see is that all of the genotypes uh, have cure rates in the 90s uh, with genotype three being slightly less you know, across the world, uh, uh, probably in the mid 90s. Uh, but if we look and look at the Safel box, which is really the salvage therapy, so that's for those patients who failed the initial treatments. So the initial treatments cure 95% of patients, uh, meaning about 5% aren't cured. And then when we retreat those with salvage therapy with the Safel box, we cure between 95 and 98% of those patients that were initially not cured with a first course of therapy, which means overall treatment cure rates uh, are about 99% for all comers. Uh, I will ask if anyone else knows of any other disease uh, that we can cure uh, with such precision uh, in, in such a short period of time, and please tell me. Uh, so with that, let's talk about what some of these special populations are. Uh, if we really do think about 10 years ago, uh, before we had these all oral therapies, what were the special populations? Uh, they were patients with HIV disease. They were patients with renal disease. They were patients with liver cancer. Uh, maybe they were those that were co-infected with hepatitis B. Certainly they were those who were decompensated. Uh, and there were those patients who needed uh, liver transplantation. As we move to the next decade where we are today, uh, you know, HIV has really fallen off as a special population uh, because the therapies that we use have cure rates which are the same for HIV infected and non-HIV infected patients. So don't think we're gonna talk uh, much about that anymore, quite honestly. Uh, I think it's important to have a discussion regarding kidney failure and those who need kidney transplantation. 
Uh, I think it's important to touch on uh, decompensated disease, uh, which we will. Uh, there are some controversies regarding treatment patients with hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, we've learned a lot in the new age of DAA therapies about the reactivation of hepatitis B. Uh, we've started to see in the United States and around the world a rise in acute hepatitis C. Uh, in the U.S. directly related to the opioid epidemic that we have and has continued and has actually worsened uh, during COVID. Uh, there are questions about transplantation. Uh, when I talk about transplantation, I'm really talking about taking hepatitis C positive organs and putting them into either hepatitis C positive recipients or hepatitis C negative recipients, and then figuring out how best we do treat those patients. And then we are interested in treating pediatrics and what happens during pregnancy uh, since we now have these therapies. So what I'd like to do is sort of systematically go through some of these, not all of them, uh, but some of them and then answer uh, questions about that. So we'll start with renal disease and that encompasses quite a lot. And if we take the sickest patients with renal disease and by the sickest patients, I'm gonna define those as that are on hemodialysis. We know that the prevalence uh, of hepatitis C in patients on hemodialysis in the US is about 4%. Uh, and it's much higher in the Middle East, about 20%. And the rest of the world uh, sort of fits somewhere you know, between those two. There in the past had been concerns about using the DAA therapies uh, in patients with advanced kidney injury and on dialysis. And sort of the nice thing that has happened is that all of the therapies that are now available can be used in patients with uh, CKD stage three, four, five um, without dose reduction. And I think that that's very important uh, that we should now feel comfortable using these medications in patients with advanced kidney disease. The only thing we do need to be aware of uh, in, the, in patients who are taking some sorts of immunosuppression, in particular cyclosporin, and I'm going to come back this, uh, to this at the end uh, where we talk more about transplantation, about drug-drug interactions. But in patients who aren't on uh, cyclosporin or other medications that potentially could have interactions with uh, the DAA therapies, it's safe and effective uh, to use these treatments in patients that have kidney disease. And in fact, it should be encouraged uh, in most patients uh, to actually do this. If we talk then about the medication regimens that are most commonly used uh, in the United States, uh, initially there were discussions of the GP regimen uh, that was felt to be the safest and most efficacious in patients with uh, a kidney injury uh, because it's, these medications are not metabolized by the kidney. And if you look at the overall results in patients who were treated, the, you get the same SVR rates, and I'm going to use the synonym cure uh, in patients with kidney, chronic kidney disease and normal renal function when treated with this GP combination. There were concerns initially uh, about the use of subosphalia base regimens uh, because of the metabolites uh, were, could be excreted, were excreted by the kidney. Uh, there was concerns accumulation of those metabolites could lead to worsening kidney disease. And that's been found to be not the case. Uh, and so we now know that it's safe to use sevosivir containing regimens in patients with GFRs of less than 30 and also in those patients who are on hemodialysis. Uh, and that's a bit of a game changer, right? And again, in the patients with sevosivir based regimens, the overall SVR or cure rates are the same in those patients that have chronic kidney disease or on dialysis as those that have normal renal function. So one can make a strong argument that the patients with end-stage kidney disease are really not a special population anymore uh, because they are easy to treat. Uh, if we just take a representative study, uh, and this is graziprevir elbazir in patients who are treated uh, genotype 1 patients with stage 4 and stage 5 disease, uh, simple two-arm study with a crossover open label at the end. Uh, this was presented by David Roth from the University of Miami 
a while back. And it's interesting because David and I had the opportunity to work together in the 90s and early 2000s when I was at the University of Miami. And, and because of the growth of the program there, you know, he really got involved in hepatitis C and kidney disease and has become a world thought leader uh, in hepatitis C and kidney disease. So this is one of the first big trials. And what you essentially can see here is that in the patients who are treated, uh, they did extraordinarily well. Uh, when in the modified full analysis, 99% uh, in the full analysis, uh, which was the intention to treat 94%. So patients with advanced disease, kidney disease, did extraordinarily well when treated with this medication. Uh, and when we look at the other DAAs, the results are similar. And so I think this should give us uh, confidence uh, that these therapies are highly effective you know, in this population. Uh, and so I think we're all in agreement, but I think what really becomes then important is to think about the timing of treatment. Should we be treating patients who are on dialysis uh, with hepatitis C, or should we wait uh, because of the possibility of these patients getting hepatitis C positive kidneys, which is common um, in the United States? Uh, and so what are some of the results? And this is a study uh, that was published now three years ago uh, in the American Journal for uh, Transplantation. And the average weight then for a kidney transplant in the United States uh, is anywhere from five to six years. So it's a long time. Uh, what this study essentially looked at is not treating patients initially uh, and then giving them a hepatitis C positive kidney uh, and then treating them afterwards. And you can see here when you do that, the overall wait times to getting a kidney uh, go down significantly. And this has become the standard then in the United States uh, for patients. So we use a lot of hepatitis C positive kidneys and place them both into hepatitis C positive patients and hepatitis C negative patients. Uh, and so this does make some sense. In fact, I think it makes a lot of sense because we cut the weight down in time significantly by being able to use these hepatitis C positive kidneys. The importance is to get patients on DAA therapy as soon as possible. And I know our kidney folks start uh, really within a few days uh, and then you can eradicate. So what are then the recommendations for the treatment of patients post kidney transplant? And this comes from the ASLD and IDSA uh, hepatitis C guidance document uh, that I looked at uh, just a couple of days ago. Uh, they really do recommend for those patients that are treatment naive uh, and non-DAA experience with any genotype with or without uh, compensated cirrhosis that uh, the GP regimens can be used, uh, SOFVEL uh, can also be used, uh, and that there are alternatives. Uh, and so you can treat safely and effectively uh, with these therapies. And so uh, there shouldn't be concern then about transplanting someone who's hepatitis C positive because you can eliminate the condition. Uh, now the question really comes up is, would you want to eliminate hepatitis C before you then introduce a, a potentially hepatitis C positive kidney into the patient, and the answer is probably no. Uh, you would like to wait. Uh, and so uh, again, I think this type of recommendation and the data I've showed you uh, gives you some hope uh, that you can safely uh, treat patients post kidney transplant. Remember in the past, we couldn't do that because we couldn't give the patients uh, interferon. And so it's been a game changer as we go forward. In the few patients who fail, well, uh, we can give them a combination of soft fail box and the cure rate's 99% in these patients. So hepatitis C, easy to treat uh, in this population. So what are the pros and cons then uh, of using these DAA-based regimens and kidney transplantation? Do we treat before you know, or after? Well, what are the arguments? If we treat before uh, transplantation, and this is kidney transplantation, the patients remain active on the wait list, we're certainly gonna cure the disease uh, 
leading to theoretical possible uh, longer life expectancy, halting the progression of their liver disease, decreasing the risk of post-transplant glomerular nephritis, and also interestingly enough, decreasing the risk of new onset diabetes after transplantation since hepatitis C is associated with uh, increased incidence of diabetes. In fact, if you treat people as an aside uh, who are diabetic, who have hepatitis C, and you get rid of the hepatitis C, we're beginning to see that it's easier to control diabetes. And in fact, many patients uh, will no longer need uh, their oral medications for the treatment of diabetes. So that's interesting. Uh, if you treat beforehand, you avoid the risk of drug-drug interactions with immunosuppression, in particular cyclosporin, if that's being used. And then overall, you do decrease uh, the public health risk. If you don't treat beforehand, well, we know that therapy is highly efficacious in the post-transplant setting and will cure. Uh, if you treat the patient beforehand, there's going to be a longer wait time for the patient to get uh, a kidney. Uh, and that may limit choices of organs. Patients may lose uh, a, a certain transplant opportunity, but there is that risk of drug-drug interactions uh, with the DAA therapy, so you need to watch them closely. Uh, and I think each center is going to make this determination. Uh, we've seen a meteoric rise uh, in the number of kidney transplants in our area directly related to the fact that hepatitis C kidneys are being used uh, in patients with hepatitis C and without. Uh, and so we tend to treat these patients after they've had uh, kidney transplantation. <clears throat> the Europeans uh, have come up with similar uh, recommendations. And so here are the, uh, from EASL, uh, these are their recommendations. They're very similar uh, to those of ASLD. So what are the take home points then uh, as regards to the special populations with uh, renal impairment or kidney transplantation? Um, I would tend to argue that they're no longer special because we can really treat and cure almost everybody. Uh, it becomes more of the art then of determining when do you want to treat someone who is going to be a good candidate for kidney transplant? Uh, but you have to think about the organs that they possibly then could get. Uh, certainly, if someone is not a candidate for kidney transplantation and has hepatitis C, they should be treated immediately. Uh, and again, they'll be cured. Uh, and so this is a game changer for those of us who were, have been doing this for decades when you couldn't treat the patients at all. Uh, and you certainly couldn't use ribavirin. And for those of you who remember ribavirin, uh, when we were treating these patient populations. If we move then to talk about uh, decompensated disease, right? And now we're talking about uh, those patients with child's B and C cirrhosis. Uh, this is a, a study that Liz Werner from Columbia uh, had published. And so there are certain highlights here Right. We know that patients uh, who have decompensated disease don't respond as well, right? uh, and I'll harp on that as well. Uh, patients with males greater than or equal to 10 have an overall SVR rate of about 90%. And it's interesting from a historical perspective that we think of that as not so good. Uh, for those of us who remember, we were so excited when interferon and ribavirin for a year reached an SVR rate of about 40%. Uh, and so 90% isn't good anymore. Uh, so these patients don't respond as well. Uh, we have to remember that in those patients that have decompensated disease, uh, we cannot use protease containing regimens because these proteases have been associated with worsening uh, hepatotoxicity um, and liver failure and death. Uh, we have to determine, like the kidney transplant patients, uh, do we want to treat these patients but before transplant uh, and then sort of take away the option of using a hepatitis C positive liver? Uh, and so that's something perhaps we can talk about in the question and answer session. But certainly treatment is indicated for all patients who are not transplant candidates, you know, with a survival. And... What we do uh, in the United States is we usually delay uh, or withhold treatment for hepatitis C and transplant candidates in areas where there's a high median melt. 
So if the median meld is in the 30s, uh, it really doesn't do the patient a favor to treat them, uh, get rid of the hepatitis C, decrease the meld, and put them further down the list. In areas uh, of the country where the median meld may be in the 20s, it's sort of a different discussion. So there's a significant geographic distribution. It may have a big difference, and I was listening to an unbelievable uh, number of, and I congratulate you, uh, patients who are treated uh, with living-related donation, one a day. Well, if you're doing that, it makes a lot of sense just to get rid of the hepatitis C beforehand. Uh, but that's really, you're, you're working in an area where you're quite lucky uh, to have such availability of livers. If we look at then the data uh, and some of the data uh, for the treatment of patients with decompensated disease, and this is soft lead uh, with ribavirin. These are the well-known solar studies, uh, one and two, uh, treating patients for 12 or 24 weeks, uh, child B and child C. And you can see here uh, from the data that the response rates, uh, as mentioned, are on average approximately uh, 90%. So not terrible, uh, but certainly not the 95 to 99% uh, that we have gotten used to uh, in treating patients with non-decompensated disease. So this is a harder group to treat, uh, no doubt. If you look at Michael Curry's data, which is published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and this is the Astral 4 study, uh, looking at soft valve uh, with or without ribavirin in, in genotype 1 patients, you see similar uh, type results. Uh, no real statistical difference between those who are genotype 1A or 1B, uh, but significant problems related to anemia in those patients who received ribavirin. And we really have moved away from ribavirin in the vast majority of our patients. So it is possible to treat these patients with decompensated disease and have an SVR. Uh, and I think this should be encouraged in those patients with lower melds uh, or in those who are not candidates for liver transplantation. And those who are candidates for liver transplantation, uh, there have to be discussions uh, really on a one-to-one -one basis with the patient in the region that they're in to determine how treatment and cure will impact the eligibility for getting a timely uh, liver transplant. If we look at the survival benefits then uh, in those patients who were treated with decompensated disease, uh, we do know uh, that by treating patients and curing patients, we improve mortality, right? So there's a greater survival. What we don't know is do we significantly improve these patients' quality of life? Or do we put them into what has been termed meld <coughs> purgatory, where we make them a little bit better, uh, but still keep them uh, in a state where they have ascites, significant fatigue, and may not be able to get a liver transplant. And what you can see here from Michael Mann's data, which was presented now a long time ago, uh, six years, uh, that if you treat these patients, uh, you see a significant decrease in their MELD score. They get better from that perspective. But have we really helped them in those patients who are potential transplant candidates? And I think this is what our transplant directors like the Satipathy struggle with as to whether or not these patients should be treated and at what time. And these are difficult decisions that are made by highly educated and thoughtful physicians. So what is the argument to treat? Well, you eradicate the hepatitis C, no doubt. You improve the MEL score. Absolutely. And you may prevent further decompensation, but you don't necessarily make them feel better. And so the argument against then treating these patients prior to uh, transplantation is you make their MELD score better, but you put them into again, this very scientific, as I mentioned earlier, MELD purgatory, where they may never get a transplant because they just won't become sick enough. And we haven't changed as far as we know the effect of the development of hepatocellular carcinoma in this particular patient population. 
Uh, and so they're still at risk and they still need to be screened. Uh, but it may be more difficult for them to get a transplant. And then have we really done them a favor? And I don't have that answer. It's so easy for me to throw out the question uh, without being able to give you uh, a clear answer. But I think in medicine, it's important that we recognize that and have the, an open and honest discussion with the patients and the medical team that's caring for these patients uh, as to how we approach them. So if we look at what the recommendations are from the Europeans, uh, it's similar to what's being done in the United States. Uh, in those patients with low MELDs uh, under 20, uh, the recommendations are treatment. In those where the MELDs are higher than 20, uh, that has to be a case by case basis. Uh, and for the most part, the recommendations are treatment of the hepatitis C after uh, transplantation. Remember, we have to choose our regimens carefully. So we cannot pick a regimen that contains a protease inhibitor. And it would be nice not to have to add ribavirin because of the potential side effects associated with ribavirin, and particularly the anemia uh, in these patients who, in many cases, start out uh, with some significant anemia. So I think this is nice. Uh, it's very clearly laid out by Easel uh, and has also been adopted or shared uh, through ASLD as well. So two major societies across the world who are making uh, similar recommendations. We know that if patients are transplanted and have hepatitis C, we can treat them. Treatment should be initiated early uh, and response rates you know, are quite good. Uh, I'm going to come back or talk now a little bit about hepatocellular carcinoma because here's where we do have uh, some controversy uh, as to whether or not patients should be treated. And so I, I think that's uh, really a discussion that we do need to have. And I think patients with uh, hepatitis C and hepatocellular carcinoma are a special population uh, because we have to make some real decisions uh, on how and when we treat these patients. And sometimes, uh, especially with our surgeons, uh, we butt heads. Uh, and so it's important that we do understand this. So what's the controversy in those patients who have hepatocellular carcinoma as a result of hepatitis C? Well, which one do we treat first is really the question. Uh, should patients with hepatocellular carcinoma be treated uh, for their hepatitis C or should the hepatocellular carcinoma be treated first? And then we'll deal with uh, the hepatitis C. Since real world data and a couple of studies here show decreased SVR rates in patients that have hepatocellular carcinoma. And if you look at what the results are in the study from BEST, which was published in the Journal of Hepatology now uh, four years ago, and there have been several others, is that patients, and I'm sorry that the numbers aren't showing up on the slide, uh, that the patients who have hepatocellular carcinoma, and that would be those in gray who are treated, do not respond as well as those patients that do not have hepatocellular carcinoma. And so the conclusion of this paper uh, was that patients with hepatocellular carcinoma and hepatitis C should have their hepatocellular carcinoma treated first, including transplantation, and then the hepatitis C be treated. And that's very important because sometimes there's an inclination just to start the hepatitis C therapy. Uh, and that's how we can breed potential resistance and non-response. And in the decompensated patients, if they fail, the salvage regimens contain protease inhibitors, which we can't give. And so we really have to think in long term uh, on how we best can treat and care for these patients. Uh, this is the other large study that was published same year, 2017, by Prenner and the, the treating of patients with or without a hepatocellular carcinoma. And the patients with had uh, more than 20% failure rate. And so why, right? A lot of theories as to why. Uh, a lot of the feeling, as you can see from this pictorial, that the virus may actually reside within hepatocellular carcinoma, and the DAAs can't get into the tumor. And so you eradicate the virus all around the tumors, uh, but then 
uh, once the DAA is stopped, the virus that's within the tumor begins to replicate and you now have recurrent hepatitis C, potentially resistant uh, to some of the therapies. Uh, you don't see that in just the cirrhotic liver. So the HCC may be a reservoir for the hepatitis C to reside uh, and sort of escape and hide from therapy. So take home messages, very important uh, that we treat the HCC first, deal with the hepatitis C later, even if that is post uh, transplantation. Another controversy that has been out there is the concern about HCC recurrence in patients who are treated uh, for hepatitis C. There are several years, and uh, Dr. Singal, I don't know if this is your paper, who's out there, uh, I hope that it is, incredibly important paper, uh, which showed that there's no increased risk of hepatocellular carcinoma uh, with DAA therapy you know, after treatment of patients uh, with cirrhosis. So very important to know that you should feel comfortable treating cirrhotic patients uh, with hepatitis C uh, and that you're not going to then increase the risk of them developing uh, recurrence of hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, and this is critical uh, piece of information uh, to the literature. So in, in people who've never had hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, de novo HCC is not caused by DEA therapy. Uh, that's important. Uh, and you have, do have to always remember that in patients who are cirrhotic, we have to continue surveillance for hepatocellular carcinoma, even after the patient has been cured. In patients that have had hepatocellular carcinoma treated, uh, the recurrent rates may be higher than those who were previously treated with interferon, but there's a bias here because we can treat more advanced, sicker patients with DAAs than we ever could uh, with interferon. Again, very important when you have someone who has hepatitis C and HCC to treat the HCC first. Uh, hopefully you can eradicate that, get them to transplantation, and then treat the patient for hepatitis C. So this is an important topic, uh, and one I think we're going to see more of, especially, you know, around the world. I'm going to move very quickly to an interesting topic of treatment of hepatitis C in patients with hepatitis B. Uh, we always knew that patients can be co-infected. Hepatitis C replicates much faster than hepatitis B. Uh, hepatitis C dominates the food for hepatitis B, which are the nucleic acids. Uh, hepatitis C grows, HBV is suppressed. And then when we start therapy, HCV is eradicated. We've now learned that when that happens, hepatitis B can run amok. Hepatitis B can replicate. We can start to seeing increased levels of HBV DNA and liver enzymes increase. And so it's very important then that all patients with hepatitis C be checked for hepatitis B prior to treatment. Uh, and what you can see here typically, and this was published by Mitch Schiffman also a couple of years ago, was just representative uh, patients who are co-infected. Uh, you start DAA therapy, you eradicate the virus a few months later you're seeing recurrence of, or a flare of hepatitis B. Uh, they can present with acute enteric hepatitis. Uh, and so you really want to know this in advance. There have been reported deaths in patients that have developed fulminant hepatitis B after suppression and cure of hepatitis C. And here are just some studies. You can see what the reactivation rates are. Patients who are surface antigen positive are at much higher risk than those who are just core antibody alone uh, to develop this. But even some patients who are isolated core antibody positive can have a flare. Current recommendations are to initiate therapy in any hepatitis B therapy in anyone who's HBV DNA positive. Uh, as you initiate your treatment for hepatitis C in those that are HBV negative, uh, we follow patients. And so, so to summarize HBV reactivation, 
It, it occurs and is not uncommon in patients who are surface antigen positive. It's extremely uncommon in those who are isolated core antibody positive. The flares can occur during therapy or even as long as a, uh, as far as a year out. Uh, we have seen deaths uh, from acute liver failure related to this. So please screen everyone, treat those patients that are hepatitis B surface antigen positive and have detectable virus. Um, I will argue that you should use any detectable virus, not a number you know, of 2000. Uh, and these patients should be monitored if you're not gonna treat them for a year after conclusion of hepatitis C therapy for flares and hepatitis B. Uh, the world sort of agrees, uh, and this is the easel uh, recommendation that you can see here. Uh, should we be monitoring these patients on therapy? Uh, the answer is probably yes, but remembering that these patients <coughs> are only on therapy for eight or 12 weeks, uh, I don't know that you're gonna get lab tests every four weeks is probably reasonable to do it at the end of therapy and 12 weeks afterwards to follow these patients, you know, and see. I'm going to skip this because it seems to be a little bit out of order and I apologize. Uh, but I do want to bring this up so people see I had mentioned it earlier. Uh, this is the risk of drug drug interactions in patients who are being treated with DAA therapy. You can see the, the common HCB therapies on the left. Uh, really the concern is in certain groups that are using cyclosporin. Tacrolima seems to be much safer uh, and have fewer drug-drug interactions uh, than cyclo. And so this is something that we all should consider. Uh, very briefly, we are seeing a rise in acute hepatitis C cases. Uh, it's important to remember that there is no prophylaxis. We don't give pre-exposure or post-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, still, patients with hepatitis C, we've now learned, will, uh, with acute disease, will clear the virus uh, in anywhere from 20 to 50% of cases. But if they're going to do it, they do it within six months. Uh, and the other thing to remember is uh, you need to have an undetectable HCV RNA more than once because there can be transient viral clearance uh, that a month later, all of a sudden is positive again. And so you can't make a decision based on a single negative HCV RNA, you should repeat that. There are certain predictors of spontaneous clearance. Those who get sick, become icteric, have very high transaminases, uh, are surface antigen positive, believe it or not, women and those of genotype one are more likely to have uh, spontaneous clearance. What do we do then uh, with patients with acute disease? And this is again from the, AS, the ASLD you know, guidance document. Uh, patients sh should be considered uh, for therapy after the initial diagnosis. Uh, and treatment can be initiated without waiting for spontaneous resolution. Right? There are a lot of reasons behind this. Uh, a lot of them are social uh, and then these patients who are getting acute disease, the majority of which in the United States are related to uh, illicit drug use and sharing of needles. And it's actually good for society uh, if we can eradicate and prevent spread. Uh, it's very important that we counsel these patients uh, with acute disease about the risk of hepatotoxic drugs and alcohol. Uh, and if possible, uh, those patients that have some type of addiction should be sent to an addiction specialist. Although there are no studies uh, that have led to uh, approval of acute HCV infection, the treatment of acute HCV infection, so it's uh, currently unapproved, uh, the recommendations are to treat from the societies and the therapies used are the same as those patients uh, with chronic disease. And so I'm gonna move now from acute disease to pregnancy and children. In general, we don't treat pregnant women who have hepatitis C. Uh, we like to treat them before they get pregnant and have a discussion, or we wait until afterwards. But this is a very interesting study that was presented at CROI uh, two years ago, uh, looking at uh, soft lead in pregnant women, 12 weeks, treating them 
in the first trimester. And they treated patients. And how did these patients, how did these pregnant women do actually with therapy? Well, it was found to be safe. That's the, probably the most important thing. All of the patients who were treated were cured and all of the infants were negative, right? We know that uh, maternal fetal transmission is anywhere from three to 5%. Uh, there were a few AEs and it was, they were really not clinically significant. Uh, there have been no concerns regarding the exposure to the DAA therapy in the infants who have been followed to date now two years. Uh, and there's a larger study now that's being enrolling actually uh, in patients who are pregnant. Uh, in the United States, the recommendations are from the OB societies that all pregnant women be screened for hepatitis C. They have not recommended treatment, but they have recommended screening. Uh, and they are the first large organization outside of the GI liver organizations in the United States uh, to make that recommendation. So what are the current recommendations around pregnancy? Um, we do recommend treatment before or after uh, pregnancy. Right? That's important. Uh, what's interesting in the United States is pregnant women uh, are more likely then because of our laws to have access to health insurance if they were previously uninsured, which gives them an opportunity to be treated. So that is a consideration in a society where 99% of all medications are paid for through some type of insurance, not directly from a patient, but we, we do need more data. Uh, we know that after therapy, uh, breastfeeding is okay. Uh, but you shouldn't put, we don't have any data uh, that patients who are being treated with DAA therapies can breastfeed. And that's important uh, as we go forward. Uh, the guidance from the ASLD is that all pregnant women should be screened. Uh, for patients who are reproductive age with hepatitis C, they should be treated uh, before pregnancy. No studies again. Uh, evaluate the safety, no large studies, except the uh, one that I showed you. And so the ASLD statement is, despite the lack of a recommendation, treatment be considered during pregnancy on an individual basis after a discussion with the patient about the potential risks and benefits. Uh, breastfeeding is not contraindicated uh, in, a in a mom who has hepatitis C, unless the nipple is cracked or damaged or bleeding. Uh, and after completing breastfeeding, uh, then the mother should be treated. To conclude, what about the treatment of hepatitis C in children? Uh, there can be spontaneous clearance up to about age three. Uh, luckily, long-term studies show that hepatitis C acquired in infancy progresses quite slowly and most children will grow up normally without symptoms even having hepatitis C. There are very few large studies that show progression of disease uh, to, to significant fibrosis in children, although there certainly are children who develop cirrhosis. Uh, recently in the United States, the therapies, uh, certain therapies have been approved for use in children uh, and they should be used. Uh, this is from, again, the ASLD guidance document. So the soft lead, soft vel, and the GP regimens have been approved now uh, for the use in children greater than three years old. Uh, they should be treated. Uh, there's no reason uh, why not. Treatment is slightly different. The dosages are different. The dosages are by weight. And so that's important. Uh, and these patients should be treated by pediatricians or pediatric gastroenterologists that have a significant uh, experience in taking care of patients with hepatitis C and understanding uh, what these DAA therapies are. The easel is slightly behind uh, as regards to their recommendations, uh, but hopefully they'll get there because uh, uh, I think it's important that we treat children uh, and here you can sort of see the approvals in the United States, uh, approvals for moms, certainly before pregnancy and after breastfeeding. 
uh, in the United States, uh, not yet approved therapies for less than age three, but are approved uh, for patients over the age of three. So I'm gonna end here uh, uh, looking at what those special populations are and we've sort of discussed. Uh, and just to summarize, who don't we treat? We don't treat those patients with advanced malignancy, including those with HCC, if their long-term prognosis is not good and they have limited life expectancy. And we really shouldn't be treating those appropriate liver transplant case patients with a meld of greater than 20 unless uh, they are going to have a living-related donation. I didn't go into some of the challenging patients that we have, active drug users and the homeless with poor social support systems. But in essence, uh, we pretty much should be treating everybody else. Uh, if we're going to reach the WHO's goal of eradication of hepatitis C worldwide by 2030, uh, which everyone has agreed we're not going to reach, there are only a few countries out there that will probably do it. It's led by Egypt, uh, but most countries will not. But if we're going to even get close, then we really need to get treatment out to everybody. So with that, I'm going to thank you all for your attention. Once again, thanks, Anjaya, for inviting me. Uh, and happy to stick around and ask questions. Thanks.